This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Welcome to A Conversation with History. I'm Harry Chrysler of the Institute of International Studies. Our guest today is Richard Solomon, who is the president of the United States Institute of Peace. He is the author with Nigel Quinney of American Negotiating Behavior. Ambassador Solomon, welcome to Berkeley. Nice to be with you, thanks. Where were you born and raised? I come from the Philadelphia area and uh, grew up there uh, in a very business-oriented community. And looking back, how do you think your parents shaped your thinking about the world? Well, in some ways it wasn't my parents. My father died when I was eight years old and uh, my mother picked up his business, which was uh, uh, a salesperson from uh, furniture factories down in the south to uh, retail outlets up, up north. So she was away a lot of the time, and uh, it was decided by, by my family that I needed more, a more supervised environment. So at the in sixth, seventh grade, I was sent to a, a Quaker boarding school on the western suburbs of Philadelphia, and for six years was basically raised in that environment. And that probably had more to do with the trajectory of my career. Uh, an environment that was very concerned with issues like public service, with international conflict issues, uh, with world affairs, and that probably was the most influential early impact on my, my view of the world. And, and did you anticipate the trajectory of your career at some point, or it was just serendipity? No, there's a lot of randomness to it. I was particularly interested in photography. Hmm. I had inherited a camera from my, my father and uh, was interested in science. And so I was uh, admitted to MIT as, uh, for, for my undergraduate college and began focusing on chemistry. And my objective early on was to be a photographer for the Magnum Photographic Agency, which you remember at that stage was a major supplier of photo photographic images to Life magazine. Henri Cartier-Bresson and many of the mm. other uh, luminaries of uh, uh, photography of that, uh, that era inspired me. And when I was a junior at MIT, I took uh, nine months off and hitchhiked around Europe with mm. a friend, uh, taking photographs, uh, figuring this is a way of sort of testing my talents. And uh, when I came back from that experience, I had a whole portfolio of, of photo uh, photographs which got me a job with a Polaroid Corporation. And uh, uh, Edwin Land, a very a brilliant chemist uh, who built, as you know, the Polaroid industry, uh, he asked me to uh, run a photographic uh, uh, image lab for him. Uh, this was 1960. I was teaching courses and doing research at Polaroid. Uh, but I had become interested in international affairs as, as a result of my time hitchhiking around Europe. And I was uh, exposed uh, to some very interesting coursework at a time uh, when international challenges were on the front and center of the agenda. I had been uh, as a sophomore at MIT in the middle of uh, the Sputnik business. When Sputnik went up, everybody was shocked. The president of MIT, uh, uh, James Killian, was brought to Washington by President Eisenhower to, to be a science advisor. And so the school was in ferment about the impact of science and international affairs, the threat from the Soviet Union. And that orientation uh, then was reinforced by the political science faculty I was exposed to, uh, particularly uh, a professor who had been born in China, Lucian Pai. Everybody in those days, the late 50s, early 60s, was studying Russian, worried about the Soviet challenge. And Pai said, well, if you're, if you're interested in uh, international affairs, what about China? And that interest was reinforced by both the encouragement of uh, Pai and the fact that 
he sent me down to, the, to Yale University in the summer of 61 to study Chinese. And uh, uh, while I was uh, talking to Pai about this way of getting involved, uh, the phone rang in his office. And the other end of the line was Walt Rostow, who then was running the policy planning staff in the State Department. And Rostow said the Chinese were having a big food crisis. This is 1961-62. And uh, he said uh, to Lucian Pai, is there someone there who could study how the Chinese are handling this issue? And uh, so it looked mm -hmm. to me as if there was interesting work to be done uh, there. Then the next year was the Cuban Missile Crisis. And almost all the faculty that uh, I was working with, studying with at MIT, were on the shuttle down to Washington trying to help the Kennedy administration figure out how to deal with, uh, with the Soviet challenge. So it was that, that mix of uh, world events, Sputnik, the Cuban Missile Crisis, and uh, the faculty that pulled me away from, if you like, or stimulated me to look at international affairs as to, opposed to the scientific and photographic career. And you, you did your degree under Pi on China studies, went, went to Michigan to teach, but then you moved on to the, to the RAND Corporation. No, it was a little different oh. than that. Uh, yes, I did get my Ph.D. under Pi uh, in 1966, uh, and I had already been hired by the University of Michigan to join their faculty to teach political science and Chinese politics. Again, this is the, the middle of the Chinese Cultural Revolution. Chairman Mao was an icon of uh, political uh, ferment. and. Uh, the, the Michigan student body was in, in turmoil and ferment because pr particularly of the Vietnam War. So many students wanted to take my course on the Chinese Revolution because they <laughs> wanted to see how Chairman Mao was making revolution. Well, I'm a fairly conservative character and uh, they didn't find me to be a, an advocate for overthrowing the university, but this was a time when students were uh, taking over university buildings and wanting the, the, the faculty, the administration to protest, for example, the recruitment by the military on, on the campus. Uh, so uh, the Michigan environment was not very intellectual. It was highly politicized. Mm -hmm. uh, I was surprised uh, at the, uh, in the spring of 1970 to have been uh, received a letter from uh, the National Security Council where uh, they were looking for a China specialist to uh, support what we didn't know at that point was the Nixon administration's effort to have a breakthrough with uh, China. When I was in graduate school, we could see the Chinese and the Soviets fall apart and uh, their conflict degenerated into a military confrontation. And Nixon had sensed here was a chance to split the communist world and build a coalition against what he rightly saw as the major threat to our security, which was the Soviet Union. And so, uh, again, all of that played into the Nixon administration's effort to open relations with China. Well, fortuitously, my training in Chinese studies uh, led to my, again, being asked to uh, join Kissinger's staff, which I did in September of 1971, and I supported the, uh, the Kissinger-Nixon effort to open relations with China. And uh, uh, what, what was it like at that time to be a China scholar, all these changes occurring, and then suddenly you're thrust into uh, uh, an administration that is essentially making contact, establishing relations. Right. Look, it was very heavy, st heady stuff. Uh, I had been trained, uh, learned my Chinese language. I'd lived for uh, two years in Taiwan and in Hong Kong, done my PhD research interviewing refugees from communist China. And to suddenly be dealing with the other side of the equation, if you like, that is, the effort to work positively with the communist Chinese, that was pretty exciting stuff. And uh, in the Nixon administration, there was a real sense of 
grappling with the big issues of history. There was not just the China opening. There was the effort to uh, promote detente with the Soviet Union, to deal with all the issues of the proliferation of uh, nuclear weapons, arms control issues. And so— uh, And in the Vietnam War. And in the context of ending the Vietnam War. You're absolutely right. So it was very intense uh, and heady, big politics stuff. If there's a theme that I see running through your entire career, it is this, this mix of theory and practice, this interface where you take academic knowledge, academic theories, and pl apply them to the real world. Talk a little about that. I mean, how do these, uh, how do these two lines uh, interface, and, and what is your role in, in making them uh, complement each other? Well, the particular theoretical focus of my graduate work was uh, studying, developing the concept of uh, political culture. Uh, and I'll talk uh, a, a bit about the split that developed, particularly at MIT, about the quantification of political science, which I think has frankly seriously undermined its uh, relevance for the study of contemporary and operational politics versus the work that I and others were doing on what, it, what is the cultural dynamic behind the way the Chinese uh, behave, play their politics versus, uh, versus the Americans? Um, the other part of my academic experience was the hostility, frankly, between the academic community and practical politics. The Vietnam War had, of course, widened that divide, and it still exists. I think uh, a lot of academic uh, uh, life is really opposed to uh, practical politics because it's involved with compromises with some pretty nasty actors. Uh, it's close to the use of violence, that is, whether it's the Vietnam War, the Iraq War, uh, et cetera. So a lot of the so-called theory that might come out of academe is not, not too related to practical uh, politics, yet I was very stimulated and uh, wrote my PhD thesis in my first book on this uh, issue of politi what is political culture? How do the Chinese view authority? How do they view conflict? How do they manage their politics? And that led ultimately uh, to uh, a book that uh, I published in uh, 1986 when I was at RAND on Chinese negotiating behavior. Henry Kissinger, uh, as you know, was uh, trained in European politics uh, as most of his experience up until his dealings with uh, the Chinese during the Nixon administration had been either with the Europeans or the Soviets. When he started negotiating with the Chinese, with Zhou Enlai and Mao uh, in 1971, he was shocked to discover they weren't communists. They had their own uh, style of managing the negotiation. And uh, I watched that at close range for five years. And then uh, in 1976, when I left uh, uh, the National Security Council staff, I went to the RAND Corporation. Uh, RAND had done some interesting studies on negotiating behavior. Fred E. Clay has written a book uh, called All Wars Must End, uh, which looked at uh, the negotiated settlement to uh, major conflicts. And so I took my experience watching Kissinger up close, dealing with the Chinese, and wrote a book about uh, Chinese negotiating behavior. And in fact, I'll show it. It's published by the, the Peace Institute now. And uh, uh, in the period when you got into government, uh, little was, not much was known about the Chinese. Their power, relatively speaking, right. was was very low. Uh, uh, talk a little about that, because they're, they're, now we're in a situation where they are on the rise, uh, are becoming a, a major economic power. So, so there's been quite an evolution. Uh, in what they can do and what they want to do in the world. But on the other hand, as this book suggests, there, there's a lot that remains the same in, their, in the culture of their negotiating.
Well, there is a real break point between the, the period when Nixon and Kissinger opened up China and dealt with Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai versus what we deal with in China today. In the case of, of Mao and uh, the Zhou period, uh, Mao had had a falling out with Khrushchev uh, back in the late 50s. They really hated one another. And uh, it led to this military confrontation. So even during the Cultural Revolution, when China was denouncing American imperialism, Chairman Mao, for security and political reasons, wanted a counterweight against the Soviets, which is why he opened up to the Nixon administration. And uh, we had, uh, I think, a reasonably positive but limited relationship with the Chinese during the last phase of the Cultural Revolution, during the last phase of, of Mao Zedong's life. And uh, just to contrast it with today, uh, during, uh, I think, the first uh, negotiation I had had with the Chinese in 72, we proposed uh, establishing pl trade relations. And we were told by the Chinese officials across the table that they weren't interested in trade. They're a we're a revolutionary society, said the Chinese ambassador. <laughs> we're not interested in trade. Uh, that period ended with Mao's death, with the downfall of the so-called Gang of Four. Mm -hmm. And uh, then when Deng Xiaoping took over Chinese politics in 1979, he overthrew the whole Mao legacy. He opened up the country and uh, established uh, trade and cultural relations. Chinese students started coming to this country, and now we have hundreds of thousands of them. Uh, our trade has grown exponentially, as you, you noted. And so today is a very different country, uh, I mean, sorry, a different relationship uh, between our two countries. And uh, we don't have this overarching secure, shared security threat that made the Nixon opening, uh, that made Henry Kissinger a superstar of international affairs. We don't have that shared security issue that welds two very unlikely societies together. The, the thrust of this uh, book on Chinese negotiating is uh, their con uh, enduring elements of culture. Do you still abide by that thesis, the, the whole notion of building relationships, having a broad conceptual view, and then working on the tactics under that? I think it's still there, but uh, the way we're managing this relationship is somewhat different. For example, I mean, the, the key contrast, and I uh, emphasize this in uh, the, the book on American negotiating behavior versus Chinese, the Chinese believe in what we call relational negotiation. They want to build a personal relationship as the basis for effectively managing a, a negotiation, a, a relationship. Americans are very business-oriented. They're practical problem solvers. And so they, they engage in uh, uh, transactional negotiating. That is, they want to negotiate the settlement to a problem, to cut a deal, and move on to some other, other uh, uh, problem. Now, Henry Kissinger really bonded with Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai in the sense that they loved to talk at a fairly abstract level. Uh, they talked about the Soviet challenge, how to manage this uh, security threat. And uh, they, I think, at some level just enjoyed interacting, sharing perspectives. And uh, Kissinger became pretty quickly what they would call a Lao Pangyo, an old friend. <laughs> That was the, the personal element of it. And Kissinger was, of course, flattered and all the rest. But then he discovered that being an old friend had a liability to it. Henry was a uh, superstar internationally, but he didn't want to lose the notion that he had managed this effective relationship with, with China. So be, sustaining the notion that you're old, an old friend means you st suddenly have to deliver as a friend to the uh, requirements that the other side, the Chinese, wanted out of the relationship. They did not like detente. Uh, they uh, wanted... Detente uh, with the Soviets. With the Soviets, yes. that's right, because then it left them exposed in this 
strategic triangle. So they criticized Henry for, for detente pretty stringently. And uh, so Henry discovered that being an old friend of the Chinese had its uh, liabilities. Um, this contrasts with a situation today where we, we turn over our uh, senior officials pretty uh, frequently, and we don't see that personal relationship now with the next generation of uh, Chinese leaders. And so we don't have quite the same basis for uh, uh, a dialogue and an understanding that is, if you like, a broad conceptual framework for this relationship. And uh, the Chinese, of course, are not as defensive in their security situation as uh, they once were. They're generating very substantial power through their economic uh, growth, which is made possible, of course, by their uh, trade relationship with us, their training of all these students in the sciences in particular in this country. And so it's a much more ambiguous or uh, conflictive uh, relationship today than it was maybe in times past. The, the big change in the dynamic is the, the, the rise of their power. How, how do you, from what you know about the culture and from your studies, how, do, do you see a trajectory there? Do you see constraints on, uh, on what they may want to do with that power? The Chinese right now are debating among themselves about how to use their power. Remember, this is a country with a tradition of, what, 5,000 years of history. They were the preeminent, the predominant power in East Asia. The Vietnamese, the Koreans, others kowtowed to the Chinese emperor in uh, the past and under the dynastic system. So the Chinese bring that notion that they're they're the big player in their region uh, to notions of how they should use their power and what they expect of other countries to uh, be deferential to them. Now, that approach doesn't really work in the 21st century. And the challenges that we all face in terms of maintaining effective uh, trade relations, uh, dealing with climate change, dealing with terrorism, there's a whole new agenda that doesn't, frankly, lead itself to uh, international affairs as the Chinese probably bring it to them based on their notion of being Zhongguo, the central power, the central kingdom, if you like, in, uh, in East Asia. And we see them debating among themselves about should they maintain cooperative relations with a country with a very different culture, the U.S., country that is pressing them on issues like human rights, uh, like uh, an approach to uh, economic development that requires a level playing field at a time when their primary concern is their internal stability because they mobilized hundreds of millions of people in their country to expect an improving lifestyle. So we have these profound differences now, and the Chinese are trying to figure out can they maintain a positive working relationship with the U.S., with other countries, uh, when their traditions bring a very different notion of other countries really being deferential to them as the major power, and certainly in East Asia. You, uh, in your book, American Negotiating Pay uh, Behavior, which I will show again, uh, uh, do uh, uh, an analysis of uh, America and our negotiating style and right. put it in a, in a kind of a broader context. Let's, let's talk a little about that, because then we'll be in a position to compare the Chinese and the Americans. But, but let's start where you start, which is to say that in understanding negotiations by different parties, there are a number of variables you could look at, the issues at stake, the, the personalities, structural factors, right. the geo politics. Uh, talk a little about that, because it, we have to put what our style is to understand the way we negotiate in that context. Right. Well, when the, you, let's start with the issues. Both the United States and China face the same basic problem, that is jobs. And the, for the Chinese, it's a fundamental matter of political stability. Again, they've mobilized hundreds of millions of former peasants, uh, people 
who didn't have a very decent lifestyle based on this fabulous economic growth. They've been growing for about 10% a year for almost three decades. And their great fear is that their economy will slow down, people will be unemployed. And because of their political system, which is centralized, rule from the top, a communist system, uh, or a socialist system, however you want to characterize it, their primary concern is that if they cannot maintain economic growth, they will face real political stability. We see this now just today in their fear that the political uprising in the Arab world, driven in part by uh, social media, by the internet, by the awareness of the world that now comes with these new electronic uh, media, that that will infect their own system. We're also worried about jobs, as we all know from our economic uh, uh, downturn of the recent years. But we do have the, the luxury of a well-established political structure system. We have uh, a social uh, network. Uh, we have a fallback system in social security, which will buffer people from the economic downturn. The Chinese don't have that. So we need to come to some understanding with them just on the issues related to our economy. Then you get the personal uh, level. Uh, again, we're turning over uh, new leaders pretty quickly. The Chinese are bringing a whole new post-revolutionary -genera post generation of leaders into uh, positions of power. And we don't have good uh, personal contact so that the notion of what the Chinese call guanxi, of connections, of interpersonal ties, doesn't uh, make the negotiating process work a little more, more s smoothly. And as uh, I say in these two analyses, the Chinese want that sense that uh, there is a shared conception at a, both a personal and conceptual level where our people, their lawyers, uh, their businessmen, they're not in there for the personal association. Then they're, they're in there to cut a deal, to solve a problem, and then go on to new, new challenges. And so we do have this discontinuity in style, which makes the management of this relationship all the more difficult. And uh, a, a, another element that you talk about is really the geopolitical situation. And so right. we are now confronting a situation where they are rising, relatively speaking to the rest of the world right. and to, to their past, whereas we are in relative decline, although there is a, a, a tendency to overemphasize, I think, our weakness. Right. So the question is, what? How, how does that fit into this equation? Does it, does it suggest that there will be maneuvering on both sides as they, they come to feel and see what they can do in the world as they relate to the other? Again, both sides are testing now the limits of their influence, their power, whether it's economic or military, in this new world. In some areas, we are cooperating. For example, the piracy uh, off of uh, Somalia, off of the Horn of Africa. We, our Navy and the Chinese Navy, are working together to try to deal with the piracy issue. The turmoil in the uh, the Muslim world. I just noticed uh, today that the Chinese are sending warships to evacuate their citizens uh, from uh, from Libya, uh, an area again where we have the same problem. We're cooperating. Terrorism, a problem where we share a common interest. Uh, economic stability. Even though we're competitive, we also share a very basic interest in an effective and stable global economy. So we have lots to work together with. Uh, but on the other hand, we do have uh, sig significant differences. The Taiwan issue, the future status of Taiwan, uh, territorial dispute, which is the worst kind for uh, coming up to some resolution, that still is a very difficult issue in the, in the relationship. Human rights. Uh, the Chinese don't want us to uh, pay deference to the Dalai Lama as a religious leader. They see it as politically destabilizing uh, human rights in a broader sense. These are areas where we have quite significant differences. So it's managing the areas of cooperation or shared interest versus the areas where we have uh, 
real differences. Nuclear proliferation, a profound uh, problem. They probably realize it, but their approach to dealing with North Korea, which is poisoning the situation in Northeast Asia, contributing to nuclear proliferation in other parts of the world, uh, we have not found the Chinese willing to work with us on that issue, on the Iranian nuclear program. So both sides are trying to find out how they can use their power, their influence in shared uh, objectives uh, as opposed to the areas where partly uh, uh, by sense of their role in history, uh, they and we may have different view of, of how the world should be structured. Uh, and uh, what is their view? Is it that, that ultimately they want a regional focus uh, or do they have a global vision? I would say in their genes is the notion that they should be a preeminent world power. Uh, and uh, they're getting ahead of themselves a bit in terms of the way this world works and uh, to the reach of their power. And so you see, again, in their internal debates, they're expecting more deference, uh, for example, from us and others than maybe we and others feel is, is appropriate. And uh, certainly, I think, in the way that we view the world, um, we don't find the Chinese sharing the same, same objectives. Human rights is a great example, or democratization, uh, giving their public uh, a role in politics that uh, goes against their political system. And so they're unhappy when we, we urge them to open up, for example, open up their internet to more lively public debate. And these are areas that uh, cause a real rub in our uh, relationship. Uh, in your analysis of U.S. Uh, negotiating style, you've talked about the business-like quality, the, right. the, the legalistic quality, let's have a goal, let's get there, process, and so on. But you also talk about two other elements. Right. One is the, the, uh, the, the notion of our way or no way, which came with the global power, right. you know, that we had in the world. Uh, uh, talk a little about that, and and also uh, our tendency to be preachers. I think that's right. in your subtitle, bullies and and preachers, uh, or the two other aspects. Right. We're going to have to adjust those characteristics, aren't we, in today's right. world? Uh, the bullies issue is very interesting uh, because. Uh, this, this book on American negotiating behavior drew on the perspectives of over 50 foreign diplomats who we asked, tell us how you see Americans as negotiators. And they would describe some of our uh, uh, officials or negotiators as bullies. And particularly where we were dealing with uh, fundamental national security issues as we were after, let's say, 9-11, or where there were fundamental economic issues uh, at play. Our negotiators would draw upon the very substantial strength of the United States to put real pressure on the foreign negotiating counterpart. And uh, that led to uh, some of these diplomats saying, we see you as a hegemon or as a bullying power. And they would identify certain officials as being more like bullies than others. And then there's the preacher part of it. Our foreign affairs is characterized uh, significantly by the degree to which pre we project our own values. Uh, and uh, I know from personal experience that some uh, of our senior officials would say to the Chinese, and this goes back some years, uh, you really should democratize. You're falling behind uh, the wave of history not opening up your country. Uh, to uh, the democratic tide. Your failure to uh, stress human rights as an important uh, issue in your own society goes against our values and against the, the trend in world affairs. So that is a kind of preachy element that is predominant in our politics and our foreign policy uh, in a way that isn't stressed so much in the foreign affairs management of other, other countries. Will, will that become muted 
as we come to realize that the world is more multipolar, the issues, as you've already talked about, you know, re requ require the cooperation of other major actors? Well, it's interesting. This, this is a source of tension in the conduct of diplomacy and foreign affairs for our country because we want to work with uh, other governments uh, in solving real problems, let's say nuclear proliferation or climate control or take your pick. Uh, but at the same time, we may be putting pressure on foreign governments to, op let's say, open up their politics. And uh, we're seeing this right today in the turmoil in the Middle East. Uh, our president is out in a very public way uh, trying to support the demonstrators uh, out in the streets, whether it's in Egypt or Libya or uh, uh, the other uh, Muslim world countries that are in turmoil right now, saying we support the people, we want openness, democracy. But on the other hand, there are very important governments in that region that we work with and need to for our own interests, whether it's energy security, our working with the Saudi uh, leadership, uh, wanting stability and a solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. We want to work with uh, was the government in Egypt or in Jordan. Uh, and so you can see these leaders may be uh, wondering where we stand. On the one hand, we're putting pressure on them to open up their politics, but on the other hand, we want to solve a problem or work with them, let's say, on the energy security issue. So this is a matter of uh, real tension. Our public, the American people, don't want to see us supporting dictatorial governments. And so our leaders are cross-pressured due to internal politics to show that their, their heart is in the right place. They support issues that are important to our society and our values like human rights and democracy. You, in your career, were director of policy planning, then you uh, were uh, assistant secretary for, for Asia, uh, and in that capacity, right. you were in, uh, 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 an important actor in the negotiations for the Cambodia settlement, which, right. as you say in this other book I will show, Exiting Indochina, that really brought to end hundreds, a uh, hundred year wars that had involved uh, external actors, the Japanese, the French, the Americans, in the Indochina uh, uh, Peninsula. Right. Oh, I want to talk briefly about that because this is a case where uh, we can talk a little about how your theory relates to what happened. What were, what were the lessons of that negotiation? Well. As you were saying, the Indochina area has been a source of great power conflict for well over a century. The French tried to colonize uh, the area, Japanese during World War II, et cetera. It's been an area of uh, Chinese influence, uh, uh, and it got us caught up during the Vietnam War period in the 60s uh, and 70s. And, uh, if there's any theory that evolved from the negotiations that led to the Cambodia settlement is that uh, for reasons related to uh, world trends, all the major powers concluded in the late 80s, early 90s that it wasn't in their interest for various reasons uh, to remain engaged in Indochina. The Soviet Union was collapsing. They didn't have the resources and the interest to remain engaged. The British again, had withdrawn uh, east of Suez, uh, you know, years earlier, but they didn't want to remain engaged. Our own country wanted, uh, wanted out. It was really only the Chinese that wanted to see an outcome that uh, would keep the major powers out and would prevent the Vietnamese from dominating the area. So uh, because of the horrific genocide in Cambodia, there was an interest on the part of uh, the UN Security Council and the major powers in trying to stabilize and withdraw from that, that area. And uh, the French, the Indonesians, each for their reasons, were trying to uh, produce an outcome. Uh, and uh, by the late 80s, they really hadn't uh, succeeded. And the United States, uh, under uh, Secretary of State uh, Baker, decided to try to play a significant role 
through the UN Security Council, working with uh, the Asian countries uh, in producing a negotiated settlement, both to the Cambodia conflict and then maybe to stabilize the situation with, with Vietnam. And so we were able to piece together uh, a settlement arrangement that met the objectives of all the major powers and enabled them all to withdraw from Indochina. When, when I read your account, uh, on the one hand, it was uh, related to a specific time, a specific place, yeah. a specific set of factors. But I couldn't help thinking about two current conflicts. Uh, and here I have in mind the Afghan, Pakistan, India complex on right. the one hand, the Middle East on the other. And what I, relating that to the Cambodia solution, one has this sense that the complexity of really reaching a solution, the 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 the, uh, the factor of fortuna of luck making it happen, and just having the right leaders and the right forms, it, it really you sort of sit back and say, "Wow, that's really hard to do." There's one uh, academic theory, if you like, that might be uh, talked about in this context, and that is. Uh, uh, Professor William Zartman uh, from the Johns Hopkins uh, School talks about ripeness. Not all problems are ripe for settlement. And what creates ripeness? Partly uh, it's uh, what Zartman identifies as a stalemated situation where both parties to a conflict are hurting and uh, they see that neither side is going to prevail. And so when it's in a what he calls a mutually hurting stalemate, you create a ripe situation for uh, a settlement. And it doesn't appear at the moment that you have a situation between, let's say, India and Pakistan uh, that is ripe for a negotiated settlement. If those two countries uh, could deal with one of the great protracted uh, conflicts of, of this world, that is Kashmir, uh, then maybe you could uh, create a more stable strategic environment for stabilizing the, the uh, situation in uh, uh, South Asia, South, uh, Southwest Asia. Unfortunately, you don't seem to have that willingness on the part of the Indians and the Pakistanis uh, to uh, cut a deal. Uh, you have uh, a differential between the relative stability of Indian politics and the chaos and the deep divisions in Pakistan, you don't have a leadership that seems strong enough uh, to overcome uh, some of these uh, differences. Uh, and uh, that spills over into the conflict in Afghanistan. The Pakistanis don't want the Indians to outflank them on their, their western frontier. And so there's this ambivalent relationship we now see uh, with the Pakistanis helping us a little bit on the war on terror, but on the other hand, wanting to support influence as it develops in Af Afghanistan. You have the religious element, which is uh, poisoning the relationship. And we have to remember that there's some uh, intractable conflicts, the Israeli-Palestinian one is another, where you have identity issues, you have territorial issues, uh, security issues, all working to sustain a conflict where, as Roger Fisher, another th theoretician, if you like, of negotiation, says that people are at their BATNA points. BATNA is an acronym for the, the best alternative to a negotiated uh, agreement. And uh, it appears in all these cases, uh, the uh, India, Pakistan, Israeli, Palestinian, the, the combatants, the conflict uh, parties are better off sitting where they are <laughs> than making the compromises to a settlement. And so those are situations where negotiation is not to produce a settlement, but to manage an ongoing conflict that could go on for decades. Talk to us now about the mission of the Institute of Peace and what you've been trying uh, to achieve there to contribute to the kind of non-military solutions to some of these problems. Well, the Institute of Peace is uh, 
the emergence of, of an institution that actually goes back uh, to the times of George Washington and many other uh, periods in our history for our, the two first centuries of our existence where people uh, concerned about the costs of war, the horrors of warfare, wanted a, a peace-oriented institution. There were over 160 or so pieces of legislation during the uh, 19th and 20th centuries for a peace organization. None of them got anywhere because the world environment didn't seem to call for it. But that changed in the wake of the Vietnam War, where, again, the cost, the horrors of that conflict uh, led a number of senators, uh, Spark Matsunaga from Hawaii, Jennings Randolph from West Virginia, uh, Mark Hatfield uh, uh, and others, uh, Nancy Kassebaum, to support uh, the establishment of the Institute of Peace. It was a dream. It was a concept uh, that really didn't have a reality. Uh, the notion that we could create a training institution that, like West Point, Annapolis, that trains the arts of warfare, we would have an institution that trained in the arts of peacemaking. That institution got started in 1980-84, uh, uh, but it really started to take off with the collapse of the Soviet Union. During the Cold War, the, the two superpowers dominated international affairs. There were arms control negotiations. There was crisis management. But the two major powers really dominated international affairs. With the collapse of the Soviet Union, what happened? The world wasn't peaceful whether it was in Somalia, Haiti, the Balkans. Suddenly, throughout the 90s, uh, we saw a range of, if you like, smaller uh, but nonetheless poisonous conflicts that the big government agencies that had created to deal with the Cold War really weren't certain, uh, weren't structured to deal with. They didn't have a certain sense of how to deal with these ethnic and religious uh, conflicts. It was in that context that the Institute of Peace which has a very broad and flexible charter from Congress, started doing things uh, that the big government agencies weren't structured to deal with. The, the one example that uh, makes uh, uh, sort of more obvious uh, our, our value, uh, General Tony Zinni called me in 1994 and said, the Clinton administration is sending my Marines on peacekeeping missions. I've trained them up to be war fighters. Would you help us retrain them for peace operations? And so we began a training program that now works with the military, civilian police, to train for the peacemaking role that our military plays. Uh, we saw in the 1990s that religion, not ideology, had become a major driver of conflicts in the Balkans and now in the Middle East. The State Department does not have a Bureau of Religious Affairs for <laughs> good reasons. But we, the Institute of Peace, had a program in religion and peacemaking. So I got my sort of more academically oriented colleagues out in the field. They worked in the Balkans and helped the different religious communities there to stabilize the conflicts that had been tearing apart the Balkans in the 1990s. So we began showing in these various areas where we had a useful role to play as an innovator of ways of dealing with conflict in a way that the big government agencies, again, that had grown up and grown strong during the Cold War period, were, were having trouble turning the great ships of their agencies to deal with these new problems. And it's in that context that the Institute of Peace has grown significantly and demonstrated a real value in helping the country deal with the very messy international environment we see today. And and what uh, let, let's talk about first what our national environment is, because it, one of the uh, the uh, dilemmas for policymaking throughout our history yeah. is a, a tendency to want to withdraw from the world, to cut back on expenditures for foreign aid. Uh, less so uh, uh, supporting the military, but more so the kind of uh, 
uh, processes and programs that uh, address what I guess is your mission to come up with so political solutions. So, so what what is the what is the the the, the obstacles domestically that we have to get over now in in the context of uh, both the economic collapse of 2008 and the the call for austerity. Well, underlying it is a basic instinct on the part of the American people. We're not interested, frankly, in being an imperial power and dominating the world. And yet we see a world in which our interests, economic and security, have required us to get involved in dealing with the Soviet challenge, dealing with uh, uh, all of the problems we see in the world today. But if you look back at our history, certainly in the uh, 20th century, uh, it's an in and out kind of pattern. In the late uh, 19th century, we were just building our, uh, our economic power, and then we got involved in World War, World War I, became a major world player. As Soon as World War I was over, we demobilized, came home, and then in the 20s and 30s, we went through a period of isolationism as you know. But then we got whacked at Pearl Harbor, and we got pulled into international affairs. We had a great war for, uh, a terrible war for four and four and a half years. And what happened, as soon as World War II was over again, we demobilized and tried to come home. But the Soviet Union started subverting Eastern Europe. Uh, there was the Korean War, there was the nuclear problem, and we got pulled into the international role we played all during the Cold War. Again, when the Soviet Union collapsed, we looked for the peace dividend. We tried to demobilize, cut back on defense spending. What happened? 9-11. Uh, we got whacked again, uh, saw that our security was at risk by developments in a different part of the world, and we remobilized and are now, of course, today uh, back in the business of trying to create stability in a world that is threatening to our both economic and security interests. The question is, can we avoid this in and out uh, pattern that uh, is, has gone on for well, well more than a century? And I think uh, our Secretary of Defense has put it uh, probably the most uh, succinctly where Secretary Gates has said, we see this pattern. Uh, can we break out of the tendency always to withdraw? Can we find less costly, more stabilizing ways to remain engaged in a world that does affect our interests, uh, but at, without always having to lead with our troops? And this gets to the work of the Institute of Peace. Can we get involved in conflicts before they've turned violent? Can we be preventive in our way of dealing with problems in the international world that do affect our interests? But can we deal with them in a way that keeps them under control before they blow wide open and force us to intervene militarily? So that's why the Institute of Peace, I think, has an important role to play. It's small. But it is a center of innovation in thinking about ways of managing conflict by political means uh, so that hopefully we don't always have to be so heavily engaged militarily. As you look at this, this uh, new world that's emerging, multilateral uh, negotiations, more important, uh, uh, global problems from terrorism to health and so on, what, what do you see as the major obstacle for the United States, given what you've documented in your book and, and, and in your work throughout the years, what is the major obstacle that we have to overcome to deal with that world in a, in a possibly different way than we did when we were at the height of our power in the, during the Cold War? Well, in some ways, it's a matter of uh, our own conception of the role we want to play in the world. Uh, and uh, coming up with a concept of uh, America as a global leader, influence, uh, that is appropriate to what our public will support and what our resources will enable us to sustain. Now, one of the interesting things as we look at history, when we uh, were attacked in Pearl Harbor, virtually overnight, we mobilized our country for defense. Uh, there was a 
clear national commitment to a strategy of uh, unconditional surrender. We mobilized our economy, which was very substantial, and we won that war in four and a half years. Contrast that with the onset of the Cold War. It took us almost 15, 16 years to figure out what was the character of the Soviet challenge. Was it political subversion? Was it a military threat to Western Europe? How do we deal with the alliance pattern that the Soviets were building, included initially the Chinese? And it took us, uh, as I say, well over a decade to come up with a strategy that had support from our people and for which we could mobilize resources. And that strategy was containment and deterrence of the Soviet military threat. Today, we don't have that conception. Uh, our our uh, government is really uh, looking for a concept, a grand strategy, if you like, that will build public support for an American role in world affairs, that will be consistent with the resources that we can mobilize both at home and in terms of building cooperative relations with other, other countries. So we're in a period of uncertainty here, and all one can say is the sooner we can come up with a concept that uh, will have that degree of public support, uh, the better we'll be, I think, to mobilize our resources, build new coalitions, and deal with this very complex range of, issue, range of issues that we face, whether it's nuclear proliferation, the impact of climate change, terrorism, uh, human rights. Uh, it's a very daunting and complicated set of issues uh, that, again, we at this point don't have an overarching concept or strategy for dealing with. Uh, if you were advising students who watch this interview and are interested in preparing for the future right. and, and see their life evolving as yours did, how, how would you advise them to prepare for the future? Well, there, there isn't one one track, one, one pattern. As uh, the book on American negotiating behavior indicates, in business, uh, if you're an effective businessman, we live, live in a globalized economic environment. Business world can play a major role now in uh, helping rebuild the economy of war-shattered countries, let's say like, like Iraq. The days when we relied primarily on uh, USAID, the Agency for International Development, to do that development work are limited. And we see that the private sector now has a major role to play in a world of international uh, commerce and development. Uh, lawyers, again, if you're interested in legal affairs, uh, train yourself in international law. You can play a role as a negotiator uh, in one way or another. Working with the NGOs, the non-governmental humanitarian assistance organizations, they're playing a major role uh, in helping to bring humanitarian relief to many countries around the world in the wake of uh, tsunamis, uh, earthquakes, and other humanitarian uh, disasters. The Foreign Service or our military, they're all vehicles by which people interested uh, in international affairs, in the security of our country, in doing good works uh, abroad, have an opportunity to uh, make a contribution. So there isn't just one path. And maybe in the course of that, they'll learn Chinese, as you did. <laughs> and not only Chinese. Again, we live in a world where I remember during the conflict in Somalia, we didn't have Somali speakers really on a broad basis. So what did our State Department or our defense people do? They went to the, the taxi cab line down at National Airport <laughs> where Somali immigrants were driving cabs and they recruited them to be interpreters at a time when otherwise we didn't have that language skill. So it's not just Chinese, which clearly is a major world language, but you can pick almost any other country, uh, you know, dealing with uh, the, the Muslim worlds, learn to speak Arabic. Uh, long to learn to speak uh, Dari or one of the uh, uh, languages appropriate to understanding uh, the conflict uh, uh, between Pakistan and India, Hindi, another language. So, isn't just uh, 
the predominant language Chinese. There are lots of other ch languages that are very important. And on that note, uh, Ambassador Solomon, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to be here. A very, very informative discussion. Thank you. Thank you for your interest. And thank you very much for joining us for this conversation with history. Thank you.